about this particular session or this particular event rather I would say. AZ104 is Microsoft Azure certification, Azure administrator certification program. And uh, here we will be discussing few aspects of Microsoft Cloud. Uh, the public cloud that we call Microsoft Azure. So before we start with this session, uh, I want all my participants to quickly introduce themselves in a chat window. So just check if you have access to a chat window here. And uh, I just want all of you to just write your name, uh, your current job role, and whether or not you have any experience with cloud. Cloud means any cloud, not just Microsoft Azure, any cloud platform. Yeah, can we do that now? OK, thank you, Tushar. OK. Adiraj and Sunil Jada. OK. I hope my screen is visible to all of you right now. Yep. Fine. So. OK, OK, yes. Thank you. Prasad, Pundalik and uh, Sudhakaran, Sajid, Pankaj and Sunil. OK. Fine, so we have DevOps. DevOps engineers, we have a technical engineer, we have SAP consultant, senior tech lead, project managers, application developers. OK, that's great. That's great. That's good. So. Before we start with uh, Microsoft Azure, let us talk about little bit about cloud as a very general kind of a concept. What cloud basically allows us or what cloud basically, you know, introduced to us was a concept where. Your entire. Software environment or your entire environment servers could be made available to you on pay as you go basis. So. We have a vendor. Like Microsoft. For example. Who have their own you know data centers across regions multiple regions like for example uh, microsoft azure has presence in more than 60 regions as of now now when i say regions uh, we have got uh, azure data centers in south india central india west india we have similar number, similar data centers or regions in Europe, America, uh, even uh, Africa and uh, uh, Southeast Asia, etc. There are more than 60 plus regions where Azure has its presence, Azure has their data centers. So you as an individual or maybe you might be an individual. Or a small or medium, small to medium business. Or an enterprise. For all kind of users, Microsoft allows or Microsoft gives you access to their data centers or to their entire environment. OK. This is cloud. Cloud basically gives you a tremendous capacity. Where the entire data center or all this environment, this infrastructure is managed by vendor. In this case, it is Microsoft. 
managed by the vendor. Vendor will manage those data centers and you as an end user, you will get access to those data centers, servers, software environment, platform environments, etc. on, you know, subscription basis. So what you just have to do is you just have to purchase a subscription, some kind of subscription, and that subscription will allow you to access all those resources which are available on these data centers. So Microsoft is basically giving you all those resources for use for deploying and managing your application and other type of workloads. This is better than acquiring all that software, hardware, setting up the servers and application environment yourself. It will be much faster and much more economical as well. You do not need huge investment in IT software and hardware to get started with your application. You can now build something and deploy it easily on cloud. And best thing is you just have to pay for the usage. Like for example, even if let's say you build an application and you were running that application for let's say just a one month, you will be paying only for that one month usage to, to your vendor, let's say Microsoft. Okay, that's the great uh, advantage. If your application need to grow and let's say you had an application which earlier needed 10 servers and now because your application is growing, num more number of people are, you know, kind of visiting your application, you need more servers and there is enough capacity available at all those data centers. Tremendous capacity or huge capacity available on those data centers. You want to run, let's say, 10 machines, you can do that. You want to run 1000 machines, you can also do that. Rather, scaling from 10 to 100 or 10 to 1000 is actually a lot easier when you are on cloud because it's the vendor, Microsoft, who's actually managing all those software and hardware environment, right? You will be given an interface, maybe like a web based portal or PowerShell or CLI or some third party tool, right? to manage your cloud based resources. So this is what cloud is all about. Cloud gives you scaling, cloud gives you higher capacity, pay as you go basis cost model where if you are using a particular service for let's say 10 minutes, you will have to pay for that 10 minutes. And if you don't want to incur any more cost, remove that service or undeployed or deinitialize it, remove it, and then you can save on the cost. That's the another benefit. Anyways, let's get straight to Microsoft Azure now. As you already know by now, Microsoft Azure is a public cloud from Microsoft and it is available at 90 plus, uh, sorry, 60 plus regions. So let me show you something about Azure regions here. So Azure has multiple regions, multiple data centers at multiple geographies. Like for example, uh, these are Azure regions in Americas, including North and uh, South America, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. Okay, so in Asia Pacific, we have uh, in India, we have three regions, basically Central India, South India, and uh, West India. So. Wait a second. Yeah, these are the regions. Even within a region, Microsoft makes sure that services are highly available by, you know, kind of dividing those regions into three availability zones. What basically is availability zone? Availability zone is basically a barrier that separates, uh, you know, one data center from another data center within a same region. It is set up in such a way or it is actually set up in such a way that if any kind of downtime is uh, incurred or any kind of service or hardware is failed or is unavailable, that will not affect all the three availability zones as one. Well. It will be limited to only one availability zone at a time. OK, it will affect only one at a time and others will remain safe. Any kind of disaster, any kind of unavailability, it will not spread from one availability zone to another availability zone. You can spread your application workload, your servers 
in such a way that any kind of downtime in one availability zone will not take your entire application down. Why? Because there is another instance running in zone two and zone three. That precaution you can take. We will talk about uh, this availability zone more once we start discussing virtual machines. OK, once we start discussing virtual machines, we'll know more about these availability zones. Now. So let me minimize this. OK, so how do I get the Microsoft Azure subscription now? There are multiple ways you can get a subscription for Microsoft Azure. Number one, you can try free trial. Azure free trial. OK, or you can use Azure free pass or Azure pass. The difference is Azure pass is basically a sponsored subscription. OK, so there are chances for many of the Microsoft trainings and events. Microsoft does offer or Microsoft uh, partner like Synergetics is a uh, one learning partner. They do offer Azure passes so that you an individual user can create a subscription for 30 days. Use all the Azure services which are available to the uh, free pass subscription or free trial subscription for 30 days. OK, so I guess Chaitali has already mentioned about uh, Azure pass earlier. Uh, at the time she was introducing or she was uh, explaining you uh, things, information about this session. So, so Azure Pass is basically a free subscription that you get, allows you to access Azure services for 30 days. Another way you can get Azure subscription. Now, if you are not an individual, but if you are a small or medium company organization, then you should go with retailer or retail subscription, or you should go with pay as you go subscription. So with pay as you go subscription, you create an Azure subscription and register it with a credit card and uh, every month, whatever resources you have consumed, Microsoft will automatically debit or automatically deduct that particular amount from your card. OK, that is pay as you go. You can also get into some kind of cloud partner or use some kind of cloud partner who will manage your as your resources on your behalf. OK, that approach is there. And then there is third type of uh, as your subscription type, which is for large enterprises. We call it EA, which stands for Enterprise Agreement. Enterprise agreement is usually for bigger businesses with, uh, you know, uh, bigger organizations where Microsoft and the organization itself, your organization itself will enter into an agreement and Microsoft will give you or Microsoft will offer as your subscription and not just as your subscri subscription. EA agreement basically gives an individual customer lots of other Microsoft services as well. So. Uh, anyone of you, is your organization using EA uh, subscription for Azure? Anyone here? CSP, OK, Cloud Service uh, Provider, CSP. Yeah, that's right. OK, so organizations will either use CSP a retail subscription or they will go with enterprise agreement. OK, but for you and me individual people, we can we could go with free trial or as your pass. You can also go with retail pay as you, you go subscription. You just have to pay the monthly charges for whatever amount of resources you consume. OK. Now let's see about AZ 104. This AZ 104 certification program has few modules rather that we will see one by one. This is actually the agenda for our today's uh, session. So let me just uh, put it here. That's the agenda. The very first thing that we are going to discuss now is managing Azure identities and governance, and then we will go and start 
discussing how do we implement and manage Azure storage. After that, we will discuss how to deploy and manage Azure compute resources. Then manage and configure virtual networking and finally monitoring and backup. AZ104 has given you know weightage for all of them. Highest weightage or if you are planning for a certification AZ104 certification, please remember highest weightage is given to these two modules. Compute and virtual network. You will rather say that 50% of weightage is given to these two modules, 50 to 60% weightage and then Remaining weightage is given to the other modules, including storage, identity, governance, and monitor and backup as your resources. These things are given remaining uh, weightage, let's say around 40 to 50 percent. So how many of you are, you know, kind of planning for AZ104 exam certification? OK, I can see there are two people who have raised their hands. Yeah, five. Yeah, that that's good. That's good. So now you know which modules are more important here or which modules carry more questions or more weightage. Compute resource and networking does carry more weightage than all the other modules. OK. Fine, fine, fine. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So let us start with managing as your identities and governance. Now, before we start with this module, I just have a very small question for you and you can answer on a chat window immediately. Do you know what is Active Directory? What kind of tool it is and do you use Active Directory directly or indirectly? Yeah, anyone? Yes. Yes, Sunil, that's right. It's an identity and access management solution. That's right. And uh, it's very popularly called by its acronym AD, Active Directory. A centralized way of managing users, groups and devices. Yeah, that's right, Ashish. That's a, a correct description of Active Directory. So what basically is Act Active Directory? It is IDP. It is Identity Provider. OK, or you can say a tool that will manage user identities and as somebody has rightly mentioned here ashish has ashish has already mentioned here thanks ashish so when i say identity it doesn't really just mean user identity identity can be of user or an application or a device so Active Directory is not just managing user identities, that is username and password, but it can manage application and device identities as well. And do you know that many of your organizations, many of your companies, you are directly or indirectly using AD, Active Directory. Now, what is good about Azure? Azure provides a cloud version of Active Directory. We call it Azure Active Directory. How it is different? Azure Active Directory is basically a multi tenant, a multi tenant cloud based identity provider. OK. A cloud based identity provider. It means you don't have to install it anywhere. Do you know that the other Active Directory is called Windows Active Directory? 
and Windows Active Directory need to be installed somewhere on your on-premise Windows machine. By the way, do we have anyone here who has worked with Windows Active Directory? Like created users, imported users, or did any kind of management activity with Windows AD? Anyone? Yeah, it requires Windows Server. Ashish has mentioned yes. Yeah, that's good. So basically, for other people here, Windows Active Directory is an on-premise software. And if you have Windows Server machine, a, a system with Windows Server, you can set up and install Active Directory on Windows Server machine. OK, it's actually a Windows feature that you can install alongside Windows. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yes, Sajid. OK, so. Basically, it's a on-premise identity provider, whereas Azure Active Directory, on the other hand, is a multi-tenant and cloud-based identity provider. Now, why I'm calling it multi-tenant? It's because it is basically now, you know, in cloud, we have concept like infrastructure services, platform services, and software as a services. You might be aware of that. Identity as your Active Directory is normally considered as IDAAS or like this identity as a service okay fine so as your active directory is multi tenant that means there is one single as your active directory and all of us are just one or more tenants just to show you more of that i have logged in into my azure portal here now this is my azure portal let me log in so when I try to log in into portal.azure.com, it will ask me for my username and password. And after I log in successfully, it will present this, this screen to me. Now, let me straight away search and go for Active Directory. The search bar on Azure portal will allow you to search for anything. So let us search for Azure Active Directory. I found it here. Once you go to Azure Active Directory, you will notice one thing that here, Azure has given me something called a tenant ID. Can you see the tenant ID here? Yes, this is a globally unique tenant ID given to my Azure Active Directory instance. And you will notice I'm using free tier plan of Azure Active Directory. That gives me some basic features. Now, this allows you to manage users and applications and devices. Now, basically device wise, we don't actually have device identities here in Azure Active Directory. We do have device identities somewhere in Windows Active Directory. In Azure Active Directory, there is another alternate. The alternative in Azure Active Directory for devices is managed identity that you can assign to a VM. OK. Yeah. Now to show you some example here, these are the number of users in my particular Azure Active Directory. OK, you will notice some of the members, some of the users are members and some of the users are guest. Guest users are basically users that belong to some another Active Directory and not your Active Directory. They belong to some other Active Directory and you have just invited them to your Active Directory and given them some temporary access. You can always. Disconnect them or put them out of your Active Directory. OK. Now this member will log in using their username and password, which is managed by their Active Directory, not your Active Directory. You will not be able to reset their password, for example. So there are several of them, guest users and member users. And guess what? You can also assign them certain privileges. So to give you an example, this user here is given certain set of privileges. Let's see what privileges are assigned to this particular user. This particular person is a global administrator. That means this person can pretty much do anything with this particular Azure Active Directory, can invite users, can invite a list of users, group of users, several users at once. We call it bulk import. OK, 
or create bulk users, right? Change their permissions, role assignment, etc. So this is Azure Active Directory. Identity management. Here for identity, we have users and we have applications as well. Let's look at applications here. There is no application currently registered here or I have not linked it with any third party application as of now, but all the applications linked with your Active Directory will appear here. Oh, I, I guess I'm looking at applications registered for particular user. Let's go back to Active Directory and then go to applications. OK, there are some enterprise applications which are ready to integrate or which are available to me basically. Yeah, these are the applications I have created some time back. Most of them are no longer needed. Actually, you will notice, for example, this one uh, was created long back in year 2018 and I don't think I need this anymore. So should I do then? I can, I guess I can safely go and delete this application. Now, whichever application is actually using this particular identity, what will happen if I delete this identity from here? Okay, it is now in a properties panel, fine. Any application who's using this particular service principle will lost its given permissions and access. Okay, looks like I have given this or I was using this in my uh, on premise Java application and this application is no longer there. So I guess it is safe to delete this particular identity. Now, if any application is using this identity and tries to use my Azure resources, the request will be rejected because identity is no longer there to support it. So there are several of them you can see here. And in case if required, you can add a new application identity from here. Is it possible to integrate it with third party identity providers? And answer is yes. You can link it with some other third party providers like SAP, Oracle, Google, and AWS Cloud. There are lots of other applications to connect, like third party tools like uh, Box, Atlassian Cloud, Cisco, okay, Fortigate, Google Cloud, and lot many other vendors are already supported here as you can see okay fine so active directory is basically an identity management yes you as a user will get an error saying that uh, the identity that you have presented like application is trying to use some of the as your resources right they will simply get an error saying that the identity that you are using is either expired or no longer exist. OK, it is as like uh, you were trying to log in into your system with username admin and system says there does not exist any user with name admin. It's like that. OK. Yeah. So this is as your active directory. Now. About the governance. Other than Azure Active Directory, Azure has separate governance tool. Now, oh wait, before we go to governance, let's talk about RBAC, role based access control. Now, I do have an Azure subscription and I do have an Azure Active Directory which is linked to that subscription. So let me go to the subscription part here. Let us search for, wait, looks like search bar is not working. Yeah, here I have it already. This is my subscription Visual Studio Enterprise. I have a, a MSTN subscription here and you can see this is my subscription status. Let's straight away go to Access Control IAM Identity and Access Management Console for my subscription. Here I can see how many members or how many people from my Active Directory have access for this particular subscription. So let's get a list. Can you see here how many of them can access this subscription? And what is their role? These are all applications, applications that can connect with my Azure subscription and you can see all of them here.
most of these are created automatically, by the way. I guess these are created when I was trying to, you know, kind of deploy some application on Azure and I was given some Azure, uh, you can say application. Uh, uh, identity so that deployment will succeed. I don't actually need many of them. I can safely just go and delete them. From here and it will just still work fine. It is actually considered a good practice or it is rather considered a best practice to to remove all the unused identities from your Active Directory. What is the risk that you will get if you don't delete old unused identities? What's the risk in keeping them? Yes, Ashish, Sunil, Manish, Arjun, anyone? What do you think will happen? No, no, it's not about cost, basically, Tushar. The thing is, old identities which still have access to your subscription could be a security risk. Yes, it is rather considered a best practice to periodically go and delete unnecessary or you can say uh, access permissions which are no longer needed or identities which are no longer needed. Yes. Five years back, uh, you know, I, 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 I read some news from some newspaper and that news was about a kind of a scam or fraud one person did to her company. There was means one of her friend left the job and she somehow was able to, you know, manipulate some of the uh, HR accounts and was able to draw salary for a person who has already left organization two years back. I don't remember more details about it, but I read I, I, I read this news on a newspaper article and this article itself is more than five to six years old now. So I don't know more details about it. So this is kind of a risk. The identity, the user or the application is no longer there but its permissions are still there and somebody can misuse those permissions. OK, so fine. So it maintains and you can see all those service principles and everything is already listed. Now these are the users. Can you see here? I have also assigned some users. I have also assigned some kind of reader permission. Do you know what is reader permission? Any idea what is reader permission? What do you think reader permission will do? Uh, this time I want uh, Pankaj to answer it. Pankaj. OK, Sudhakaran has mentioned read only access. Yeah, that's right. So it simply means that you will not be able to make any changes. You can only see the things. Yes, that's right. Kundali. OK, looks like there are some identities which are deleted, but their permissions are still there, so I will just delete them. OK, make sure you don't remove existing users who are still connected to your systems and they lose immediately lose access because you deleted them. Fine, there are more fine tuned controls available, like for example, you will see here this person or these two people are given virtual machine contributor rule. There are so many different rules, custom rules or predefined rules available in Azure that allows you to specify what kind of controls you are going to grant to a user. To give you an example, let me show you this one. Let you manage virtual machine, but not access to them and not the virtual network or storage account they are connected to. So virtual machine contributor will give you permissions to manage the virtual machines, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you will be able to RDP into it or SSH into it. For that, you need different set of credentials and permissions. OK. 
yeah you will be able to start them you will be able to stop them you will be able to you know force updates on them etc but you will not be able to access their storage or network so there are some predefined conditions like that and in case if you are wondering how these conditions are actually defined as your internally use json javascript object notation to define all those rules can you see the permissions here hello these are the permissions allowed on a particular uh, user to vm to network and all these tools right you will see it here so this basically defines what kind of permissions you can grant to an individual user group or app this is called rbac role based access control please remember microsoft active directory or azure active directory recommends just in time admin or just enough admin for rbac have you heard about just enough admin just enough admin yeah just enough admin what exactly is this concept it means when somebody ask you for administration privileges you ask them why do you need administration permissions what kind of administration you do are you going to just manage users then you should be user administrator yes what user administrator can do user administrator can create or manage existing users new users or you can create vm administrator the one who will manage virtual machines so don't just give them all permissions give them only selected permissions that is what just enough admin okay so there are different administrators available in azure and you will see that not all of them gives absolute control to your subscription that should be avoided altogether okay so that's about the azure active directory now about governance for governance azure use a policy tool azure policy tool Now, what is Azure Policy? Azure Policy tool allow you to create your own governance policies for using the subscription. Now, Azure subscription, or for that matter, any cloud-based subscription, give its users immediate access to all its data centers, regions, and host of services which are available there. but guess what you need to control access to it let me tell you the reason for it many a times organizations why organizations are adopting clouds one benefit is cost yes but do you know that if you do not use it properly cloud might actually result in higher cost than on premise if you don't use it properly or if you don't set proper policies and conditions for it to give you an example why let me just take you to azure documentation page searching anything in azure documentation is rather quite easy just type azure doc space colon and then whatever you are looking for i am looking for vm size let me show you some of the virtual machine sizes available on azure there are some virtual machine sizes available for high performance compute and they are really very costly vms looks like pricing is not mentioned here uh, let's check this one vm pricing yep so what you are trying to use 
are you using Linux VM, Windows VM, which series you want? Let's say I want to use the E series VM in East US and I want hourly cost. So let's see this. Can you see the cost? Hello? Now it's quite possible that your team might choose a higher configuration VM or you might end up doing something called over provisioning. Now what if your team selected the highest available VM size? Can you see the cost of this VM? It's $4.60 per hour, but it gives you 64 CPUs and 504 GB of RAM. This is random access memory, not the storage. OK, whereas the smaller VM gives us two CPUs and 16 GB of RAM for a fractional cost. Can you see that? Yes, it's very much possible that your team might do an over provisioning. Right now, how do we control that? You can create an Azure policy that will put a restriction on subscription usage. Like, for example, you cannot deploy resources with this particular pricing plan, higher pricing plan, or you cannot deploy resources on a particular region. Or while deploying a particular resource, you must enable certain optional feature. That can be that can be the policies. So to give you an example, example policies, for example. Backup for VM must be enabled that could be a policy so if you are creating a virtual machine you must configure backup for a virtual machine yes downward scaling is also allowed deeper rather azure actually has two different directional scaling horizontal scaling and vertical scaling vertical scaling is where you increase or decrease amount of cpu and ram and horizontal is where you decrease or increase number of instances getting my point so yes downward scaling is also allowed and is actually recommended to lower the cost okay because lesser cpu and ram or lesser resources deployed equal to lesser cost you will be paying for the given service you can also have restrictions on certain pricing plans in as you we call them sku stop keeping unit or sto store keeping unit okay so some pricing plans you can disallow or you can have restrictions on certain locations or regions okay that is as your policy as your policy will allow you to create your own organizational rules and apply them on your subscription your resource group or your entire management group now when i say as your governance as your policy not all as your policies are very strict the policy enforcement the policy enforcement could be different like for example there is a policy enforcement type called audit what is audit in audit policy it will not stop you from doing whatever you are doing in audit policy it will just check whether your newly created resource is abiding all the policies if not then just mark it as non compliant so if new resource doesn't follow the policy then mark it as non compliant nc yes that is audit but there is another policy type deny enforcement what will happen in deny enforcement any guess anybody can you guess what deny will do if your new resource is not following a policy or goes against a policy. No, it's not about access. 
it's about creation itself will be aborted. So if your new resource doesn't follow the policy, then resource creation itself is aborted or is cancelled. That means you won't be able to create the resource if the policy enforcement type is deny instead of audit. Am I clear? Yes, so you won't be allowed to create that resource if it is deny enforcement. So it is a very strict policy. It means as your governance won't allow you to create a resource which doesn't match with the policy. It's very strict. It's not just going to mark it as non-compliant. It will do not allow you to implement it at all. Now, I want to give you a small activity. Right? I already told you how you can easily search anything on Azure. Just type Azure Docs, put a colon mark, space, and type whatever you are looking for. Now, I want you to search for the other policy enforcement types. I have given you only two policy enforcement type audit and deny. Those are most commonly used policy enforcement type, but they are not the only types. Can somebody quickly search what are the policy enforcement types in Azure? Can you do that quickly? I'll give you two minutes to try this out. OK, so I have put a timer here now. Wait a second, why it didn't start? It looks like this application doesn't work like that. OK. Yeah, here it is. Your time started now. Can you quickly search for this as your policy enforcement? So anyone found it? Looks like somebody has posted a complete message. Arjun has found something and Sunil also has found something. Sunil has shared a link and Arjun has shared the entire text in a chat window here. So. Uh, no, Arjun, what you have posted is an example of uh, uh, policies. OK, policy initiative, not enforcement type. OK, allowed location, add resource to tag. They are all examples. Let's see what Sunil had shared with us. Enforcement decision guide. OK, fine. And. 
OK, this is a best practice or document that you should follow for best practice. Let me show you how many different enforcement types available in Azure policy. Policy. Enforcement types. Let us search for policy enforcement types and OK, this was the first link that you got here, right? Fine. These are the policy types actually. Can you see that everyone? We have seen only audit and deny, but there are many other types like append, audit if not exist, okay? Deny, deploy if not exist, disabled and modify. Okay, disabled means this particular enforcement should be disabled for a time being and it should not be enforced here, right? OK, looks like Ashish has posted another link about enforcement mode models enforcement mode. Yeah, this is right. This is right. This is the enforcement mode. Property. OK, so this is how policy is defined and inside that we have enforcement mode. For assignment. You can keep it enabled or disabled, but this is only about enabling and disabling. Actually, the enforcement type are not mentioned here. Anyway, this is where you will see the list. OK. I'll share the link with you. Here it is. These are the different enforcement type. Now let me give you a very simple example of one of the Azure policy. In Microsoft Azure, there is a concept of resource group which is basically just a logical container that allows you to keep all your resources under one single umbrella or one single group, and you should be able to manage them, delete them or recreate them, or maybe assign RBAC policies on them, or maybe you can create uh, some kind of cost budget on them on the resource group. So let me show you one example of a resource group based as your policy. What I will do is I will go to Azure portal and I will search for policy here. Policy. I'm searching for policy. And this is the Azure policy tool and under Azure policy tool. These are my policy definitions. You will notice there are lots of built in policy definitions I do have. Let's see what all policy definitions are there. Yes, there are plenty of them. Let's use a policy definition that requires a tag. TAG. Tags. Tags are basically key value pairs that you apply on a particular uh, resource. So there is. There is a tag required. Uh, uh, definition here you will see. As per this definition, a department tag is required on all the resource. Let's do one thing. Let's see what is the effect defined here. The effect is audit effect. That means it will not stop you from doing it, but it will add it as a. a non compliant resource, so let's assign this. Let's add it to my entire subscription. Next. Policy has no parameters. Fine, let's review and create the policy here. This is a custom policy I have created a couple of months ago, uh, which makes sure that every resource you create need to have that department policy name. Let's try to create a new resource group now. I'm creating a new resource group here. Let's give it a name. AZ104. I want this in East US. And here you can add a tags, but I deliberately did not add any tag. And let's review and create. It's not stopping me from creating the resource, but it will add it as a non compliant resource. How do I know it is non compliant or compliant? Let's go to Azure policy tool. And in Azure policy tool, in the very first screen here, you can see, OK, looks like it is not yet applied. The tag required policy is right now showing that. Everything is valid or everything is compliant, but the reason why it is compliant is 
it is not yet enforced or it is not yet detected. You will see the compliance state is not started. OK, please remember it might take approximately 30 minutes for the policy to actually do its first test run or first run. So only one thing I can do here is just keep refreshing this page a couple of times to check if policy is enforced already. Deny policy will be automatically verified at the time of creation, but not uh, compliant policy takes time. OK, it has not yet invoked. What I will do, I will come back here after two, three minutes and then we'll check. Fine. So this is how policy enforcement or governance basically work. No, you can choose any region for that matter. I chose East US because it was already selected. It was the resource that I have created or it was my last uh, resource that I created in my Azure subscription was created on East US. So Microsoft Azure portal, the web based portal has simply remembered my last selection. Getting my point. It's all the web app thing. OK, portal is just trying to guess that I want my next resources in East US. You can deploy it anywhere for that matter, whichever resource uh, location is available to your subscription. Fine. So with this, we discussed our first module, which is Azure Identity and Governance. Governance basically means Azure Policy Tool. And what Azure Policy Tool does, it allows you to maintain internal governance. You can create or use existing policies to make sure that your subscription is in right hands. OK. Fine. Any questions on the Active Directory part or identity and governance part? Anyone? Yes, actually speaking, the policy that I have created is not only about resource group. It is about all kind of resources as well. I didn't specify anywhere that tags are required only on resource group. That rule is applicable to other resources also, not just resource groups. OK. Individual resource like VM, app or even uh, data disk can also. Uh, make uh, this particular policy enforced on. Anyone else? Okay, Ashish. Uh, if you want a resource to actually or if you want as your policy tool to actually make the changes to resource, there is a policy type called append. Policy enforcement type append can do that. So what basically append will do? Append is used to add additional field to the requested resource during creation or update. Getting my point. OK, uh, append is not intended for non tag properties. If you want to add a tag, you can just use append policy. What append policy will do? It will just check if tag is there for a resource and if it is not there, it will add it automatically. Am I clear? So yes, we can do that. Yes, so I will just just do one thing. I will share this link to you here and what is great here is you might also get a demo here. How to guides. OK, I guess there is no how to guide here. But there must be some example available here. No, there is no full example. They just have given a partial code. No, there is no demo actually on this, but this information is quite in detail here. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Any questions? Yeah, sure. That's good. Just give me one. Just give me a minute. Meanwhile, if you have any queries, you can post them here. OK, so I guess. Uh, yeah, one more question we have got from Shri Devi. Definition type there comes policy and initiative in Azure portal. What's the difference? Uh, policy initiative is basically policy assignment. Policy initiative is actually a group which may contain one or more definitions. So what you do is you create a policy definition which contains what you expect or what you want uh, as your governance to do, right? What kind of uh, check it should run? Then you add it to initiative and you add that initiative to your subscription or resource group. In one single as your initiative, you can have one minimum one as your policy, or you can group multiple as your uh, policies into one single initiative and then assign that initiative to your subscription. OK, so initiative is when you assign policy to your subscription or when you actually enforce it, it is called initiative. OK. Just creating policy definition doesn't mean it will start enforcing it automatically. You have to add it to initiative. OK. Fine. So. We will then move on to the next module, which is implementing and managing the Azure storage or storage. Now, whenever we talk about storage or whenever we talk about cloud based storage, many a times people do compare cloud based storage with other storage services like OneDrive, Google Drive, etc. But please remember services like Google Drive or OneDrive are SaaS services, software as a service, whereas Azure Storage is an infrastructure service, IaaS. So what basically storage is? Do you know what are the pain areas when it comes to storage on premise or maintaining your storage on on premise? Storage actually requires some kind of physical storage devices. And guess what? Any kind of hardware, let it be a compute resource, networking resource, or a storage resource or storage device. Every physical hardware, every hardware is subject to usual wear and tear. And they have their own shelf life. Like it may, you know, kind of uh, survive for, let's say, two years, three years, five years, et cetera, right? Depending upon usage and handling, et cetera as well but hardware can get old can you know have some problems after a couple of years of usage after their shelf life expired right normal wear and tear now what if i tell you what if i tell you there are many organizations where even the physical storage that they maintain or the storage devices that you they use throughout their organization there is an internal policy where after a particular number of years or after the shelf life of that particular storage device is over, they literally destroy it. I was having this discussion with one of my participants in other training, and they said they literally drill a hole in their magnetic disk and then throw it away, making sure that data cannot be recovered by anyone from that storage. And they don't just wait for that particular hard disk to actually show any kind of symptoms of its old age or 
unavailability or bad sector or something. It's just that it's already old. Replicate that data to some other storage device and destroy this one. Now, do you think it's going to be very costly for you to replace all your older storage with a newer one? Hello? Am I audible to all of you? OK, so managing storage on premise storage is actually a challenge. Storage devices are not cheap. They are costly and you have to purchase them, use them for a couple of years and then you have to replace them periodically. Even though a normal hard disk might actually survive even for 10 years or 20 years, we usually do not keep using the same storage device for that longer. OK, so number two, storage devices might, you know, create some kind of problem in future or some kind of bad sector, disk read, write failure, some, some kind of problems might arise. One very common practice many organizations do internally is they don't just store their data in only one hard disk. There is a concept of data replication. What is replication? Replication means keeping your data in more than one storage medium. What is benefit of keeping your data at more than one medium or more than one storage? Yes, what do you think? Why should you keep your data in multiple copies? High availability, yeah. Ashish, that's a, that's a technical term for it, basically. Yes, that's right, but it's a technical term. Just to avoid any kind of for, you know, availability issues or just to avoid data read write failure. Yeah, it's like disaster recovery. If you cannot read any data from your hard disk number one, you will read it from disk number two instead. Same data is already replicated. OK, this is called high availability. RAID is different actually. RAID can be used with a different options basically. Yeah. Failover access. Yeah, that's right. You can call it failover access. Now, what if I tell you if you need storage, you can use a cloud based storage service where all this thing is managed by your vendor. To give you an example, if you use Azure storage, if you use Azure storage, for example, in Azure storage, Microsoft will periodically destroy the older storage devices, this, and replace them with the new disk. And they do it frequently. So as soon as a particular physical storage device has become old and its shelf life, whatever it is, is over, they will immediately replace with the new devices and they will do it periodically. Number two, do you know that Microsoft internally maintains three replicas of your data? What does it mean? It means for you, there is only one data item. Yes, but when you put it on Microsoft Azure Cloud, you don't know that there are actually minimum three copies of that data item actually exist on Azure Data Center. How many copies minimum? Minimum three copies. This is called storage replication. So when you look at it, you think that there is only one item or there is only one data item, but actually there are three copies of it exist within Azure. Azure Storage Service, we call it Azure Storage Account, actually. Yeah. So it will ensure that there are always three copies maintained. OK, and guess what? It's the lowest you get in Azure. You can actually go for another access, uh, another replication mode where instead of just three instances or three replicas, you will actually get six replicas instead of three. Yeah, I will explain that deeper. Just give me a minute.
OK, in Azure, we have a concept of a region. And within a region, we have availability zones. Let's see, this is Azure region one. And then for disaster recovery purpose, you can have your data in two regions. Let's say region one and region two. In region one, you have three availability zones. So let's say you have availability zone one, you have availability zone two, and you have availability zone three. So in a given as your, uh, uh, let's say region, there are three availability zones, availability zone one, availability zone two, and then availability zone number three. And let's say you have similar setup in the other region also, of course. Now, as your storage account provides a replication strategy, OK, now there is a first replication strategy called LRS, which means locally replicated storage, where there will be three copies of your storage will be created and all the three copies will be created in the same region. Getting my point? All three copies in the same region. This is called LRS. And this is the cheaper option. But as you can guess, what happens if this particular availability zone goes down or become unavailable for some time? All the three copies of my storage will become unavailable as well. So Azure has provided another model, which is called ZRS. Now what is ZRS model? Under ZRS model, you get three copies of your data. One, in each region, sorry, one in each zone. This is called ZRS. Am I clear? Zone redundant storage. Now, what is benefit of zone redundant storage? Anyone? Yes. What do you think is benefit of ZRS here? This is what Sri Devi you were talking about. Three copies means three availability zones. Then yes, but then you will have to create it as ZRS zone redundant instead of LRS. If you create LRS, all the three copies will be maintained in the same availability zone. So do you want one copy in all the three zone or do you want a different copy in different zone? If you want different copy per zone, use ZRS. If you want all of them in same zone, use LRS. LRS obviously is cheaper than ZRS. OK. And then we have another replication strategy, which is called. GRS. Now what is GRS? In GRS replication strategy, instead of just three copies, you will you will get actually you will get six copies. How it is possible to get six copies? I will explain. In GRS, you will get first three copies in one region, primary region. In primary region, you will get three copies. OK, three copies in primary region. We call it primary. OK. This is primary. And then you get additional six copies in secondary region. So you will get another three copies somewhere here. This is called GRS. Am I clear? So three copies in. First region 
and three copies in another region. Yes, you are right, Deepak. Unless there is a natural calamity, calamity and entire region is down, your data is always available. See, we are just trying to reduce chances of getting unavailability here. Anyway, your data is even safe in LRS mode, locally redundant storage as well, because there are very few chances that entire availability zone will go down. Okay, the probability of entire region going down is actually much lesser than a probability of getting entire availability zone getting down. No, Deepak, there is no recovery system as such. If you want GRS, you can just scale up. You can move from LRS to GRS. But please remember, if you are changing the pricing plan from LRS to GRS, the actual data replication might take some time. It's not like you just change the LRS to GRS and in next minute you try the recovery. Not be available there. I'll tell you the reason. Reason is, Whatever data you are writing, data will be written to primary endpoint or primary copies instantly, synchronously. But the same data is written to secondary copy asynchronously. Okay. Yeah. So it is possible to move from LRS to GRS, but the synchronization will take time. All the data has to be moved from local system or local region to another paired region. Now, Azure has recently introduced one more type, which is GZRS. Now, what is this GZRS? GZRS has made things even more complicated now. But what it does anyways, in GZRS, data will be replicated or data will be stored in multiple availability zones. Your data will be actually stored in multiple availability zones in your primary region. In primary region, data will be at multiple zones like this. OK, so in first primary region, your data will be stored at three availability zones. OK. OK, so we have GZRS here. This is the second instance. And this one here is the third instance. This one here is the third instance. OK. Yeah, so this is GZRS. Now in GZRS in primary, the primary data center, you will get three copies at three different availability zone. But what about the second one? In case of second, all the copies will be at the same location. Getting my point? So in case of GZRS, you will get zone redundancy only in primary data center, not in secondary. In secondary data center, all your data is in the same region. Am I clear? Just give me a minute. I'll just share the diagram with you because I feel it's little complicated at first. So. Yeah, I have saved it now. And I will put it here in a chat window for all of you to access. Just give me a minute. Yeah, GRS literally means globally redundant storage. What is globally redundant storage? It means 
it basically means that three copies of your data will be stored in your primary region and there is additional three copies of data stored in another paired region okay another paired region there will be other three copies of data will be maintained this is because in case if all the three availability zone or if your data is not available entire region goes down you should be able to get the data from second region and then there is gzrs where local primary data center also data is put into three different availability zone but in second region data is stored in all in the same uh, availability zone there is no distribution there i have shared the diagram here i know it is little complicated so can you see the diagram i have shared here in a chat window just give it a minute okay OK, yes, we should continue then. Fine, don't worry, we'll take a break uh, once we uh, understood the storage types and storage services. OK, just uh, 10, 15 minutes more.
Yeah. Am I audible? Okay. So let's see. Azure Storage is a cloud service, infrastructure service. And when I say infrastructure service, Azure Storage actually provides multiple different types of services under the same service name storage account. Now, what are the interesting services available under storage account? Once you create a storage account under storage account, you get multiple different kinds of services. Like for example, there is first type of service called blob storage, which is basically used for raw storage. Blob storage is a raw storage. OK, there is no file system. You cannot mount it. You cannot use it as a D drive or E drive in Windows machine, etc. Blob storage can be used for raw data and all kind of data, text file, binary file, audio video file, etc. Then you have another service type which is called file share. Azure file. File share is very similar to blob, but with only one difference. It can be mounted as network drive inside your VM. OK, and it also allows more than one application to access them. Whereas blob storage is not good when it comes to multiple application accessing same file at the same time. File share can be mounted as a network drive like on a machine, you can add it as a X drive, Z drive or P drive and use it like a normal. Folder. Fine. So we have these two types of services. Third type of service available on Azure storage account. A very basic one is message queue. Now, how many of you have worked on applications that communicate with other applications asynchronously using some kind of message broker? Any developer here who has worked on message brokers? Hello? Any developer who has worked with messages, asynchronous messages? RMQ, yes, that's right. Yeah, I know that's RabbitMQ. R for Rabbit. Message broker. There are lots of other message brokers, Bhavin. RabbitMQ is one of the very popular open source message broker. Yes, you can use Kafka, you can use Service Bus. Service Bus is an enterprise service and it's much bigger and more robust service than Azure Storage Account Message Queue. Yes, so Azure Storage Account provides a message queue, a file show, a share, and a blob storage. There is one more, fourth service type. And this service type is for tables. These are NoSQL databases. So as your storage account, as soon as you create a storage account, you get access to these four types of services under one single storage account. But then how can a user or an application access this particular storage account? Now, so let me clarify one thing. A user can access storage account and all the services from the storage account using some kind of tool. Now, what kind of tool you can use? Tool number one. You as an end user, you can use as your file copy command called AZC as your copy or uh, AZ copy command. The AZ copy command is basically a CLI for managing your Azure storage. Okay, so this is option number one. Or you can use another tool called Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer. Let me show you Storage Explorer from Azure. Okay, wait a second. Looks like I don't have Storage Explorer, but I do have. Azure Storage AZ copy. Looks like I no longer have that Storage Explorer installed, but there is a tool which allows you 
to access Azure Storage using a GUI tool. Azure Storage Explorer is basically a GUI tool, and Azure Storage AZ Copy is a command line tool. Storage Explorer is basically a GUI tool that you can install on Windows, Linux, and Mac machines. It's available for all three OSs now and allows you to manage your storage accounts. Add data to it, for example. And the most common approach is applications using storage SDK. Do you know that Microsoft Azure has SDK for almost all major programming languages? Like for example, we have Java SDK for Azure storage account. And what Java SDK will do? Java SDK will allow your Azure storage uh, to be accessed by Java applications. Then there is a SDK available for .NET developers. There is SDK available for Python developers. There is SDK even available for Node.js as well. Uh, now, may I know which is the programming language you people use more often? Mention any programming language name and I will show you a small uh, ready to use demo, which is already on Azure Docs page for accessing storage. OK, Sham has mentioned two languages, Node and C Sharp. OK, Python, C++ from Bhavin and Prasad has mentioned Python. OK, fine. I will show you some of these demos. Let me show you that quickly. Azure Docs storage demo with Node.js, let's say. Code examples. Now there are some code examples available here and let me show you some of the Node.js demo. Like for example, OK, uh, wait a second. Let's use. Yeah. You can see this, for example, is a small code that will allow your application to just see how many blobs are there in Azure blob storage. Or how many files are there in Azure blob container? This is the code and you might have guessed it right. This is actually a Node.js code. This is basically a JavaScript code. This is the API I'm using here. Right, and if you are wondering like what libraries are being used, it's using Azure SDK. OK. This is it. It's using Azure SDK. There is a component called container client with shared access signature or shared uh, key credential uh, component. .NET environment config is getting uh, loaded here. ENV will provide all the environment variables and configuration strings, and this is the code. This is a Node.js code. In case if you want a different code, let's see what other examples are there. Like if you want to do that from C++, there is a library available for C++ as well. And this is an example. Literally, a C++ program getting access to Azure storage. Can you see the hash include? Bhavin? Provided you have the libraries available in your compiler, just add the include statement and this is how you will write it. This is a typical C++ code. OK. Yeah, so it is possible for accessing storage programmatically. And let me tell you one thing. This is the most common approach. These two approaches are mostly used by administrators. Whereas developers will use this approach to make sure that end users are able to use those APIs to access the storage. Is that clear? Now, in order to allow this particular user or application to access storage account, there are two ways you can provide the authentication. Not actually two ways. There are actually three different ways authentication can be done for storage account. So for authentication, you have got three approaches or you have got total three methods. Number one, as you are ready. You can create as your active directory. Yeah, just give me five minutes. Once I have explained this diagram, I will we will take a break. OK, Deepak. Yeah, I know I'm continuously talking for one point five, one one and a half hour now. Not one and a half, I guess it's already a, around six. Five, just five minutes more. So authentication, you can do it with Azure AD or you can do authentication using 
storage access keys, or you can use third approach, shared access signatures, SASH tokens. There are three ways you can authenticate yourself, or you can control access to storage account by Azure ID identity or by access keys. Uh, Prasad, exam preparation we will discuss later on after some time at the nearly end of this uh, uh, module, OK? And actually, it's relative to every individual. Fine. So these are the three different ways you can authenticate yourself or your users for storage account. OK, please remember as your ready authentication will actually may grant that particular person access to other storage or other services also, whereas access key will be specific to a particular storage. Now this access key is only for this storage account and you cannot use it for any other storage or any other service like that. OK. Yes. OK, so I guess we should take a break here now. I'll, I'll share this diagram as well and let me put the timer. Just a small 15 minutes break and then we'll continue. Oh, not this. Yeah, this is better.
Uh, OK, I'm back now. Uh, so. Yeah, so before we continue, I just a small reminder. Chaitali has posted a message in a chat. If you have seen that about uh, Microsoft official courseware. See, whatever I'm explaining to you right now using those diagrams and all right, there is even more material or if there is even more content available at Microsoft official courseware. You will get an official courseware from AZ104 uh, where you will get uh, contents more than I guess around 1000 pages right on AZ104. OK, and uh, it does include, uh, you know, diagrams similar to this. Lots of explanation about small, small things. OK, uh, demos and labs, everything is included in that. So I would recommend all of you to please, uh, you know, kind of uh, submit the form and get uh, this a uh, free MOC. OK, fine. Let's continue now. I hope my screen is still visible to all of you, right? It's visible. Can we confirm? Is my screen visible to all of you? OK. OK, OK, fine, fine then. Just give me a minute. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so we were discussing the storage services and as I told you here uh, or as you can see from the last diagram that I made storage services, you can authenticate to storage service using any one of these three options, either as your Active Directory or access keys or SAS token. So just a minute. OK. So you can either access them using access keys, Active Directory or SAS token. Now, blob storage is very popular storage service for variety of things. Like for example, what all things can we do with blob? Blob is used for many different things. Like for example, virtual machine disk are blobs or the past DBs, databases or database services available in Azure, use disk storage by default. OK. Azure Blob can also be used for maintaining the logs, application logs. All that data is usually stored in Blob storage. Then what is use of file share? File share is mostly used as a shared drive between multiple VMs. Message broker is used for asynchronous communication. between applications or let's just say a sync communication and no sql database table i don't have to specify what is use of it now let's see how storage account is created in azure to create a storage account just log in into azure portal and once you are in azure portal 
you can just use uh, the portal UI to create new storage account. Let us search for storage account from the search bar. Type storage and you will get a result like this. Let's go for storage account here. And uh, it is actually going to list all the existing storage account for me. Let me hit the create button now. And once you hit the create button, it will give you the actual storage account uh, creation page here. Now. OK, so let's give it a resource group name. You can create it in some other resource group as well. You can create a new resource group right from here. Let's give it a storage account name. Let's call it. Account 101022. You will have to make sure that your storage account name is globally unique. Because it later becomes part of a URL. You can choose region where you want to deploy this like I should deploy it or I could deploy it somewhere in Southeast Asia, for example. Just just a minute. Yeah, OK, sorry. So we are creating a storage account here. I've given a unique name. Region I have selected Southeast Asia. I have selected Southeast Asia standard and this is locally redundant storage LRS. Next. There are some additional options you can configure here. Like like uh, require secure transfer for REST API. Enable block public access. Just a minute. Then enable public access for blob. 
storage account key access, etc. And I will just accept all the default values. Networking, you can choose whether you want your storage to be available from all the networks or public access. OK, so enable access from all the networks. Then you can have features like soft delete to be uh, enabled. Soft delete, what it mean? It will, uh, you know, not delete anything if you try to delete it on the first attempt. Whatever data you delete, it will be stored or it will be retained for seven days. OK, it's like a recycle bean, basically. OK. Let's keep the default values for this. You will notice one more thing. Uh, there is a built in encryption available for storage. It is. It is a feature that you cannot actually disable. You cannot say that I don't want encryption, but there are two options. Either you can use Microsoft managed keys for encryption or you can upload your own encryption keys. In case if you want your own, you can choose customer managed encryption keys. But then you will have to assign or you'll have to create as your key vault and upload your keys there on a key vault. Let's continue using default option, which is Microsoft managed keys. And now review and create. I'm planning to create the storage account. I'm going to create the storage account now. This is the resource group name. This is the location and this is the account name. After I hit create, it will start creating storage account for me. Let's wait for it. OK, it's creating the account. So this is going to be my account here. You can see account creation was successful already. And uh, for this particular storage account, you will see the replication that I have chosen or selected is locally redundant storage. May I know how many replication copies or how many copies Azure is going to maintain for this particular storage account? Anyone? Three copies and this is LRS. That means all the copies will be in the same region. OK, now if you want, you can just go to the properties section here and change the uh, uh, strategy here. Like for example, let's go to the configuration tab under settings. This is the navigation bar for this particular storage account and under the setting you will see that these are some of the options you can enable disable and there is a drop down at the end. Can you see the options here? Hello. You can move from LRS to GRS. Can you see the option here? It can move from LRS to GRS. Now, right now my storage account is empty. So if I do LRS to GRS now, it will be much faster. OK, but I don't want that. Let's go to the storage. Don't want to save any changes. And for this particular storage, let's go to the Properties panel. Where is the properties panel here? Yeah, endpoint. Sorry, not properties, endpoint. And you will notice one thing there is a separate endpoint for each service. If you want to connect to the blob storage, this is the endpoint. In this endpoint, 
the first part here is storage accounting followed by blob.core.windows.net similarly you have one for share uh, file share one for message queue and one for no sql table can you see all the all the four endpoints here hello and this is the reason why storage account name has to be globally unique that means there must be no other storage account on azure which uses this name okay to make sure that this url work okay but just having url is not enough you need to have access keys as well and let me show you where are the access keys these are your access keys this is the account name and these are the keys which are by default hidden let's show them this is the access key which will work like a password or like a token yes these are rest api endpoints yes and no these are not rest api endpoint as such these are basically connection endpoint for the actual rest api you have to refer to as your management api okay to give you an example let me show you that resource.azure.com okay login into resource.azure.com and this is a panel that will show you the actual uh, uh, rest api that you need to use rather there is no need to call these rest apis manually instead of calling rest apis manually you should use azure storage sdk which provides programmatic api or programmatic uh, way to access the resources looks like it's still loading okay will take some time Here on the left hand side panel, you will get all the list of resources that you can choose. Let's try to OK, it's still way loading. See this? Yeah, it's loaded now. OK, so I'm looking at storage service, so it should be under Microsoft dot storage. Where is the storage service? Here, Microsoft storage. Fine. Under Microsoft storage, let's see the operations and these are the rest API endpoint or rest api for all the operations so to give you an example just to give you an example this is storage end, endpoint or endpoint for actually performing write operation on message queue this is for read operation on message queue these are the real uh, rest api endpoint ashish okay yeah but instead of this there is a sdk that you should use in your project OK, so storage account access like that. Now about other such storage service like this is blob containers. You can create a container and add files to it. So let me add a container here. Let's call it images. I can make it private, which is default, or I can allow anonymous read access. Anonymous read means no authentication just for reading data. Fine, let's try that. And in here in images, let me upload some files. What I'm planning to upload here is. Wait a sec. Let's upload this image. Now, if I want anyone to access this image, I can do that. I have already given anonymous access. Let's test this out. This is the endpoint URL. Can you try accessing this URL from your browser? I have already posted it in a chat window now. URL which I have posted in a chat window, please try that. Are you able to access this image? Is it working? I have just shared a URL with you. This URL. This is because of anonymous access. I have enabled anonymous access for it. If I remove anonymous access, you will lose access to this file. How many of you are able to access this image using the URL I have supplied or I have provided? OK. OK. Anyone? I'm not getting any replies. Hello, am I audible to all of you? I 
Hello, am I audible? Okay, Pundalik, fine. So let's proceed now. So this is the storage service, Azure Storage. Other than Azure Storage, the next Azure uh, service that we will be uh, discussing today is deploy and manage Azure Compute Resource. Now, what are Compute Resource? In Azure, Compute Resources can be categorized as infrastructure as a service resource and platform as a service resource. So what exactly is the difference between IAAS and PAAS? Any idea, anyone, what is IAAS? Hello? Anyone? In IAS infrastructure module, you set up the servers, the load balancers, right? Traffic handlers, everything, and then deploy application. Whereas under pass, you do not manage the servers. What you do is, Choose the template, the ready-made template, or choose the right configuration and deploy your app. There is no server configuration setup of any kind. Let me put it another way. In infrastructure as a service, what you do is you create virtual network. Inside virtual network, you deploy virtual machines, then deploy your application inside those virtual machines create the load balancers to distribute the traffic, set up the complete environment and then put your application on that environment. That is called infrastructure services. In platform services, you don't do the environment setup, but instead you just pick up an existing environment and just put your application on that existing environment. That is, co that is called platform as a service, PaaS. Okay, now. Please remember in infrastructure as a service benefit is you can customize it. It is highly customizable. You can make it run any kind of applications. Number one, you get control over the environment. The actual virtual servers, right? But you know what is negative point about this? You need system admin team. For server management, for managing your servers, you need a team of system managers or administrators or IT operations team. Getting my point? Yes. Then what is benefit of PaaS? Number one, easy to use for developers. Now, why it is easy to use for developers? Because no server administration skill required. That means if you are a developer and if you want an environment ready to use environment where you will just put your application and forget about rest of the things, server management and all, choose pass. But then there is one disadvantage of pass. And what is that disadvantage? Selected or, you know, it doesn't support old legacy runtimes rather in past service there are multiple restrictions on what kind of application you can deploy let me give you an example of pass one such example of pass service in azure is azure web app so let's say i went to the azure portal as usual and i wanted to create azure pass service OK, so web app. Let's go to the app services here. We are at the app service now. Let's click the create button here. And I'm planning to create a new app service here. There is even a free plan available. So resource group, I will choose AZ104. An application I want to deploy here is, let's say, navimumbai.azurewebsite.net. This is going to be my domain name. 
the free domain name that Azure provide. So my website URL will become navi-mumbai.azurewebsites.net and I want to deploy code. Now, this is what I wanted to show you. Can you see the ready-made environments or runtime stacks? If your application is using .NET 6 or 7, you can choose it from here, or if you want ASP.NET 3.5, you can choose it from here. Am I right? But as you can see here, there is no support for old legacy technology ASP.NET 2.0. <coughs> You just have to assume that this 3.5 should be backward compatible with 2, but that's just an assumption. OK. Similarly, for Java developers, there are only three versions of Java supported here. Java 8, 11 or 17 long term support. Any Java developers, by the way? Do we have any Java developers here? Fine, no worries. For Node, you will see there is only Node 16 and 14 is supported because they are LTS, similar to Java. These are LTS version of Java and these are LTS version of Node.js and only LTS is supported on Azure. For PHP, there is support for 8 and 7.4. And for Python, you can see here, Python 2 is not in the list. Did you notice that? By the way, any Python developer here? Anyone? Hello. Somebody did mention that he is worked with Python. OK, fine. No worries. Python can also be used for other purposes, not just application development. So there is no support for that. So this is going to be a big challenge for you as a developer. What if you have built application in an environment which is not supported as per this list? Then you have to understand. Then you have to choose other alternative. Fine. Let's do one thing. Let's keep the server stack as. PHP 8.0. And I will keep region as Southeast Asia as usual. OK. Application service plan. Let me change the pricing plan. We have got lots of options here to choose from, but I will choose my favorite. Free personal plan. OK, one GB memory will be given and then the deployment. This is how app service looks like, right? These are pass. Now, what is benefit of pass? Easy to use for developers, no server administration skills required, but it may not support all of your legacy runtimes. That could be a disadvantage. Now, under infrastructure services, we have got something called a VM, virtual machine. Let me show you an example of VM here. For virtual machine, let me search for VM and here I got virtual machines. These are the virtual machines. Let's create a new one. When you create a new virtual machine, you will notice one thing. There are a lot many details you need to provide for creating a virtual machine. Now, what are those details? For example, you have to choose resource group as usual, where you want this machine to be created. You have to give it a name. Let's call it Web 1. You have to choose a location where you want to deploy this. You can choose availability zone or availability set options here. Let's use availability zone. And then it will ask me whether I want this particular machine to be deployed in zone 1, zone 2, or zone 3. Did you notice that? Hello? You know what is benefit of selecting an availability zone here? This way, I can put one of my machine in zone 1 and another machine in zone 2 and yet another machine in zone 3 to improve high availability of my application. But remember, this totally depends on what region you select. Please remember, there are few regions in Azure which do not as of now have support for availability zone. OK, Central India has availability zone. How what about West India? I do not know whether they have availability zone in West India. Can you see this? The error message. Here the error message says that Azure do not have availability zones in West India. West India is basically Mumbai location. As of now in Mumbai location, they have only one availability zone. 
So there is no selection of available. But if you go to South India or Central India, they will have avail oh sorry, South India doesn't have availability zone as as well. I guess availability zones as of now are available only for Central India. OK, somewhere near Pune. So there are three zones available there, so it depends which region you have selected. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Deepak, it's not called ping issues. There is a, another technical term for it. Latency, high latency. But please remember. Yes, but please remember there are many occurrences where people actually choose a region far away. Now there are two different reason behind that. Number one. Do you know that in IT it's not it's never black and white like you choose this one A or B. There are always many other factors like for example, what if the latency difference between Central India and Europe might be let's say addition of 10 milliseconds. Now there might also be possibility that a particular resource has lower cost in Europe West. OK, or UK West than let's say West India. So what you might do, you might do a comparison there. What you want, do you want low latency then deploy it into the nearest region? But do you want lower cost? And if you are ready to compromise latency a bit, then go with another region which has cheaper resource or cheaper cost for the resource. Am I clear? Hello. Let me give you another common example. You must have noticed all my previous deployments. I either choose East US or Southeast Asia. On an average, Southeast Asia is cheaper than West India and Central India and South India. OK, fine. So, but the latency might not be big issue. It's not that far away, kind of, right? Like Europe, Southeast Asia is actually geographically nearer to us. Now, don't measure the distance on a map. OK, uh, the latency is quite good compared to Europe. Fine, so. We have this option selected here. You can choose multiple images here. Can you see the ready to use images? There is choice of operating system. You can deploy SUS Enterprise, Red Hat Enterprise, Oracle, Debian, CentOS, Ubuntu. All these are Linux. In uh, addition to that, you have Windows as well. You have Windows Server, Windows Server 2019, Windows Server 2016, and Windows 10 Pro and Windows 11 Pro. Please remember 10 Pro and 11 Pro is not for free subscription users. You can use these three server OSs. Let's use the latest one as a Windows Server 2022 as your edition. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Is it validation error? Let me check if it is allowing me to select this image. OK, size is not supported. Fine, let me use a different size. This is the lowest size I guess it will support. Still, I guess there is some problem with the image name that I have selected here. Let me choose a different one. Yeah, this is supported, I guess. So this is the VM size. Then I will use username and password. Let's say my username is this, my password is this. I just have to type this username and password two times. OK, keep the port RDP port open. OK, then go to disk. It will be created under a managed storage account anyways. So whether you want to use internally a standard HDD, yes, magnetic disk for cheaper storage and it will internally use locally redundant storage. So cheaper cost. Fine. Encryption is by default there with platform managed keys, Microsoft managed keys. Yeah, port open is there in basic tab. Let me go back to the basic path tab. Can you see this? I want to keep RDP port open. You can also open them later via NSG, network security groups. Fine. Under networking, every virtual machine need to provide a network. So select a new network or existing network and a public IP address. Again, you can select the inbound rule here in the networking tab again. Under management, there are some additional options available. 
like you whether or not you want boot diagnostic to be enabled here, whether you want OS guest diagnostic. If yes, then choose the storage account where diagnostic logs will be stored. If no, no need to select anything. Do you want to add managed identity to this VM? Managed identity. Yes, you can open custom port Deepak very easily after VM is created. Rather, opening and closing a port is a very common operation that you will do on a virtual machine. OK, now managed identity will allow your virtual machine to get registered on Azure AD directly so that inside the VM you get all the privileges to access your other resources. I will not use it right now for a time being. Advanced. Under advanced, you can add some applications or extensions or add custom data. Tags, if there are any, you can provide and then review and create. First time you click review and create, it will do a validation whether all the values you have configured them properly. And if you have configured all of them properly, then it will go ahead and give you a message saying validation is passed. Let's click the create button now and this will create the VM. Did you notice the cost here? 9.8702 rupees per hour. That's the cost. OK, done. it's working. It will take time. Virtual machine provisioning will take a lot much time. Yes, the cost is only when the VM is running, but remember it's not that simple. For virtual machines, we have one very, very, uh, you know, kind of a specific problem when it comes to cost. If you deallocate VM, if VM is deallocated, not just stopped, but deallocated, then Microsoft would not charge the compute charges. Compute charges would be no longer there, but you still, but you are still charged for the storage your VM is using, but storage cost is minimum, very small. Even for test VM, yes, there is a cost. As soon as you create a VM, there is a cost involved. Whereas for past services like app service, if you create a free service plan, free service plan means literally free. Yes, there is one more thing, however. Under pass, what if you choose some kind of application, non-free version? Even after you stop the application, you will be still charged for that application. There, is, there are only two ways you can avoid getting charged for your past service. Number one, scale down your past service to free tier. OK, or number two, delete the service. Yes, Ashish, you will also be charged for a public IP. Public IPs are not free. Yes, so you will be charged for storage, but for public IP again, as I said, it's little complicated. There are two types of public IPs dynamic public IP and static public IP. If your public IP is dynamic, then it is there is no cost when you deallocate the VM because IP will be released. But if it is a static public IP, then you will be charged even after your VM is deallocated. Is that clear, Ashish? OK, so when IP, IP is not released, you have to pay for the charges. Yes. Is Internet accessible? Yes, by default, you can access Internet from Azure VM. It's not disabled 
or it's not uh, you know kind of uh, uh, need any configuration at all as you provide internet access inside all the vm you can create some nsg rule to disable it okay but it is by default enabled and yes there are network cost there is also a network cost okay network cost means the bandwidth used by vm please remember when i say bandwidth there are two categories egress and ingress can anybody explain me what is egress and ingress ashish sunil Prabhat, Tushar, not sure. Yes, it's outbound. Egress means outbound and ingress means inbound traffic. OK, they're just technical terms. Don't uh, worry about that much. Egress means outbound traffic. Ingress means incoming traffic, inbound traffic. Yeah. Internal and external connect. Yes, oversimplified, but yes. Yes, Deepak, that's absolutely true. Absolutely correct. Fine. So there will be cost for that, but this cost actually is per GB and it depends like whether your app, a VM actually transfer data in GBs. OK. Fine. There is also a pricing calculator available on Azure in case if you want to correctly estimate cost of your VM, cost of running VM. OK. I will share the URL for Azure Pricing Calculator to all of you, so you will get an idea. Azure Pricing Calculator. Azure Pricing Calculator is right here. OK. You can use this tool to create an estimate. Like, for example, I want to find out cost of creating a VM. So these are the parameters here where you are running this VM. Let's say I want to run this VM in West India. So. Yeah, West India. I want Windows VM with only operating system. There is no BizTalk server or SQL server needed. And category is compute optimized. I'm using F series and this is the VM size. I'm using F series VM. Yeah, I will I will I will share that content. Yeah, just give me a minute. This was about the. Policy. And. This one is about the VM and overall agenda. OK, yeah. Let's go back here. Fine, so this is it. I'm trying to run, let's say 10 VMs. I'm planning to run 10 VMs and I'm going to run them 730 hours per month. Yeah, I will I will share that as well. Yeah. License is included, pay as you go. And let me do one thing. I don't want uh, amount to be in US dollars. It does support Indian currency here. So Indian rupees. So the cost would be like this. Can you see the cost for me this this VM for me? This is average per month. OK, 2,32,000 for running 10 VMs of this particular configuration. Now, by the way, if you want smaller VM, you should not use this, but you should use general purpose VM. In general purpose VM, you will get lesser capacity, but lower cost. Cost is much lower. Can you see that? And this is pay as you go for 10 VMs. Right. Now, how can I lower my cost? If you want to lower the cost, if you want to lower the cost, you can go with reserved instances, but looks like reserved instance is not available for A3. I guess I need a different pricing plan then. Let's use D8. D. Yeah, this is available. Let's use three years reserved with Azure hybrid benefit. And can you see the monthly cost is much reduced now? Yes. Why? 
because two reasons. Number one, you are doing reserved instances. That means you are promising Microsoft that I will be using this VM for three years. OK, so they will give you 62 percent discount roughly. And as your hybrid benefit means you are saying that you already have license for Windows OS and you just want to use your existing license. You can provide the storage here. How much storage is available here? Storage given here, let's say I want 256 GB of storage and I'm planning to use 10 disk. So this is total cost because there were 10 VMs. Storage transactions. Please remember the transactions are counted in 10,000 units. OK, so 100 into 10,000, 10, I guess it would be 1 million. OK, there will be charged like this. And then the bandwidth charge. If there is any, yeah, bandwidth, inter-region inter bandwidth, bandwidth between these two regions, let's say. There will be charges for that. You will notice one thing, 5 GB data is free, but what if my actual communication requires 100 GB? Can you see the charge here? Hello? Yes, you have to choose 10 disks because you have selected 10 VMs. Every VM needs a separate disk of its own, right? That's why, but you can actually choose more VMs, a more disk as well, right? You, you can probably have, let's say, two or three disk on a VM. This is just for the calculation part, estimation part. This is how you can create an estimate of your own. OK. Yes, you will even notice the cost will have totally different impact if you choose Linux. There is no Azure hybrid benefit available here. Why? It's not needed, right? You don't need Azure hybrid benefit if you are using Ubuntu Linux. Let's just keep one VM and one disk. Price will be much cheaper now. It's only 12,000 rupees for one VM now. OK, that's the pricing calculator. That's the virtual machine. So basically, virtual machines allow you to implement this kind of thing. Just give me a minute. I will just share this image also with you now. OK, I have shared both the previous diagrams. OK, page one, page four. OK, there is nothing on page two, so I haven't shared that. OK, so that's the pricing calculator part. Looks like my VM is already ready. Let me just go and check the VM now. OK, there are no tags applied on this VM. VM name is Web1, and can you see the public IP of this VM? This is the public IP. Now, if I try to access this VM, I just have to use the public IP and RDP port to access the VM. OK, this is the public IP. I should know the username, password and IP address. There is one more thing, by the way. It is also possible to run a command inside a VM without RDP. What you can do is basically just go back to the VM and inside your VM, this is virtual machine. Search for run command. Yes, just like MSRTC. MSRTC is, uh, yeah, there is a there is a MOC code for this course. Yes, Jahid. Okay, and uh, I don't know whether uh, you have read this message from uh, uh, Chaitali sometime back when we took a break. Uh, you have to fill up a form to claim your MOC code. Okay, yeah. So here again. This is the run command and we can just go ahead and run some command on this particular 
VM. Let's go to the run PowerShell script. And here, let me do this. Install Windows feature. Name of the feature is web server. OK, this will install IIS, by the way. This is how you can install IIS web server on Windows Server Machine. It will take some time. This is actually a quick ad hoc way of accessing and running some script on your remote server without using even Microsoft Remote Desktop. OK, while it's running, I will open Azure portal in another tab. And for this VM, let me show you how you can open a new port if required. So this is my Azure dashboard and on Azure dashboard, I will just go ahead and open a port. Go to the networking tab. Under networking tab, it will give you a list of all the open ports. Right now, only RDP port is open. Let's add one more inbound port. Here, I, I, I'll just open the, uh, the HTTP port now. Yeah, where is HTTP? Here it is, one on the top. Let's give it a name. Allow HTTP. That's the name. Now, a new NSG rule I have added. OK, I've added a new NSG rule here, and this is for allowing the access. Fine. Let's try this public IP now. OK, uh, OK, wait, wait, wait. This is the public IP. Let's try to access this public IP from the browser panel here, and let's see what it shows to me now. It might take some time because installation might be still running. Let me check. Yes, looks like the script has not finished yet. Web server installation is still going on, and I should be able to access that port only when it's properly installed. So I may have to wait for a minute here. OK, it's taking a little bit more time and that's the only thing we don't have much. Right, it's already seven o'clock and uh, we have another one hour for additional two modules. So I guess we should just stop here for the compute options. So in compute, I explained to you two different things. Application services pass and virtual machines compute service. Yes. There are other two options also available to you. Containers individual containers using app services or container instance, or you can use container orchestration like Kubernetes. Oh yes, I guess IIS installation is done now. So that means I should be able to access my application from here. Just have to reload. It's done, it's installed. Can you see that? The default IIS page. OK, fine. It looks it's done. Now, so this is all options that we have under compute. So under compute, we have options like. Uh, wait a second, where is the other one? Here it is. So under compute, we have pass services and infrastructure services. Under infrastructure services, we have virtual machines. Under pass, we have web apps, application services, container services, and Kubernetes cluster. AKS. There is also another pass services available like Azure databases, like uh, Azure database for MS SQL, Azure database for MySQL, MS, Azure database for PostgreSQL. There are multiple options under pass available where you don't have to set up anything, just get the ready made database. Now we will not discuss more about pass here because in Microsoft Azure, we have a totally different certification program for app services or for pass services. It's called AZ204. OK, it's a different, uh, uh, you can say, certification program for pass services. This one, AZ104, is more focused 
on infrastructure services and not on pass. Am I clear? Hello? Yep, fine, thank you. So let's do one thing. We have discussed little bit about the VMs and all. Let's take a little two minutes break here. Just a breathing time, okay? Just two minutes. Just give me two minutes and then we will continue. Yes, I'm back now. OK, so we were discussing something called. Uh, uh, compute instances here, right? Am I audible to all of you?
OK, yeah. Yes, so. We discussed these points. Let us now discuss the next module, which is virtual network. Virtual network is all about, you know, how we can. Wait a second. We got a question here from Shri Devi. Uh, after 30 days, what resources are free for 12 months? After a free trial, only pass service, free pass services available. Uh, yes, only the free services which are available for 12 months are as your free app app service that I explained to you the free F1 service plan that is available for next 12 months and then it's no longer accessible to you. Please remember if you happen to run your free service plan or free application service uh, after 30 days are over, your application will continue to run but you won't be able to manage it. You won't be able to change its configuration. You won't be able to scale it up further because you have lost your subscription access. OK. Now. In virtual network, we have networking component. We have public IPs. We have private IPs. Right. We have network interface card that connects your uh, virtual machine to a network, right? We have another module under networking where the purpose is distribution of load or load balancing. Do you know how many different types of load balancers are available in Azure? We have Azure load balancer. We have application gateway. And we have traffic manager. Application gateway and traffic manager can also act as a router, whereas load balancer will work only as a load balancer. You can set up your application, deploy your application or VMs into a network and then create a load balancer that will take user request and distribute it to more than one instance. So basically the environment that you will set up here looks more or more or less like this. Let me show you that. Let's say this is your virtual network. We call it VNet. Within this VNet, you might have multiple subnets. Subnet is basically a part of VNet, or let's say a small uh, subnetwork, rather, we can say. So we have, let's say, subnet one. Let's assume subnet one, you have multiple VMs running. Let's say the VMs that you are running inside subnet, they are, let's say, web one, web application instance number one, web application instance number two, let's say this is two, and then web application instance number three, this is going to be third instance, let's say, number three. So I have got three instances here for the web app. Then I might have another subnet here, let's say subnet 2 which might be running my backend application okay so let's say for backend application also i do have three instances so let's say this is a backend application backend 1 backend 2 and backend 3 by the way why do you why do you need or why you should have three different instances here or multiple instances here what is the benefit this does offer? High availability. And here you can have internal load balancer. Internal load balancer. Now what internal load balancer will do? It will allow you to do the traffic diversion. Or traffic distribution. So basically internal load balancer will take the request from all these instances and forward that traffic to one of these backend instances. Am I clear? Hello? 
yes and then here you can have public load balancer the difference is public load balancer is able to use public ip to connect with end user what is benefit of using public load balancer now your application is accessible from internet from outside whereas internal load balancer is private that means it's only within a network not outside network that's the difference so you can set up this type of environment using azure virtual networking components primary there is no primary load balancer it's only called public load balancer there is no primary load balancer okay now as your load balancer also use another simple property which is called health probe may i know anyone here what is health probe do you know what is health probe anyone yeah what is health probe and what is use of it or why you should use health probe anyone what is benefit of health probe health probe allows you to verify whether all those instances are up and running now what happens if one of the instance is not able to respond yes it will check whether the instance is up or down if the instance is down no request will be forwarded to that particular instance load balancer will only forward the traffic to those instances which are up and running and not for those who are already stopped or already crashed that's what a uh, health probe will do that's another feature of azure load balancer and you can use it for both public as well as internal load balancer okay now we also have another concept in azure called traffic uh, manager the what is use of azure traffic manager you may, you might ask me let's say you have a particular application deployed in two different regions let's say the entire setup is replicated in another region okay now this is in one region let's say uh, southeast asia and this is another region let's say east us now what will happen if your application has to support multiple regions you can then place one more component in front of them let's call it traffic manager and guess what traffic manager can be configured in such a way that it will send all the traffic to this location and that too depending upon what kind of traffic it is like for example it can be based on latency or geography if it is geography then all the traffic from asia let's say will be transferred here and let's assume all the traffic to rest of world is sent here now what do you think is benefit of having this type of traffic management what would be benefit of this sending all the traffic from asia to one region or one uh, environment and for rest of the world use another environment what would be benefit of this anyone it could be multiple things like for example it could be latency or you have one single application but for two different customers for customers in asia you have different application and for customers in 
rest of the world you might have different applications. OK, and it can be also used in DR side, by the way, but in DR it will be a little different in DR. All the traffic will always go to the first region and it will be diverted to the second region only when first region is down. Primary site is down. Am I clear? So this is what comes under networking. Networking is indeed a very, very complex module here. OK, and it requires a lot more time to understand networking. Any module in networking, it's anyway going to take time to understand the concept and also these type of demos will also take a lot more time to set up. Yeah. Fine. So in networking, we have load balancers, we have networking. OK, also there are other concepts like, for example, security related concept. We have Azure Firewall. What Azure Firewall does? Protect your environment as usual. Do you know Azure Firewall can protect your environment from most of the common types of attacks? Like, for example, it will automatically give you protection against SQL injection attack. It can also detect if a user or it can also detect if you are getting too many requests. It's called DDoS or DOS, denial of service attack. All those features are built into Azure Firewall. You can even get DDoS protection, premium DDoS protection separately without firewall. You can install it directly into your Azure VNet, but there will be cost associated with it. OK. Yes. Any questions about Azure networking? Anyone? Any questions? Networking related questions, anyone? OK, then. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes, Sunil. Sir, there are multiple networks and units. And mm -hmm. How to configure that? Multiple networks. OK, see there yes. are two different ways. There are two different ways about networking. Number one, networking is something that requires proper planning. Like hmm. for example, uh, you may have one single application deployed in four different region. Hmm. Yes, so what you may have to do is you may have to replicate the same network at four different region, but its configuration should be identical to each other. Like there should be same set of subnet. There should be, uh, you know, a similar range of IP addresses available there. If, if you are not going to pair there up, them up, you have to use equal number of services like each one of them will use load balancer. Each one of them will use, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of uh, application. Uh, wait, wait, wait. What is it? Application mm -hmm. gateway or something. So mm -hmm. one way to do that is you can create one environment, convert mm -hmm. it into a template or create a JSON template. In Azure, mm -hmm. we have got something called ARM template. Deploy mm -hmm. it as an ARM template, test it, and if everything is done good, just redeploy this template in four different region and you will get four identical networks. OK, mm -hmm. or right. what if you have four different applications which may mm -hmm. require communication with each other? There is a mm -hmm. concept available in Azure called VNet peering, mm -hmm. which means you can let one virtual network communicate with another virtual network over mm -hmm. Azure backbone network. But then mm -hmm. you have to ensure that there are no overlapping IP addresses between them. VNet mm -hmm. one should have complete different range of IP addresses and VNet two should have a different range of IP addresses as well. OK, mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. And as Thank I you said, so yeah. As I said, networking is a very complex and uh, uh, you know a very lengthy module in AZ104. Mm -hmm. To be very mm -hmm. specific, we could have a complete four hour session dedicated on Azure VNet and still there will be few things left over. Mm -hmm. Right? OK. Right. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. yeah, welcome. So there are a lot many things about network, but the best thing to actually practice or best thing to learn about it just refer to your 
uh, MOC, Microsoft Official Courseware. Rather, networking, there are three modules dedicated to networking under your MOC, Microsoft Official Courseware, and they are the lendiest modules of them all. Okay. Now, last service, monitoring and backup. What is monitor? Any idea, anyone? What is monitor? Don't worry, I will not take more time here. Uh, as per my estimate, we should be done with 20 minutes, within 20 minutes now. OK. What is monitoring or why do you need monitoring? Please remember it's not something that is related only to cloud. You need monitoring anyways for on premise resources as well. You need monitoring so that you can verify whether your application is working fine. Monitoring allows you to detect bugs or to detect any kind of issues in production quickly. Without monitoring, you won't be able to detect any kind of issues or any kind of concern that your application might be having. There is another use case of monitoring. Uh, now, like for example, many a times people ask me a question like, uh, we have a workload running on premise servers, right? Now I want to, you know, kind of move my application to Azure VM. I want to run my application in Azure VM. So tell me which virtual machine size I should use. Should I use a virtual machine size A1, A2, A3 or DS1, DS3, DS4? And then I normally ask them a counter question for that. Before you can choose which virtual machine size or which pass service size SKU or pricing unit is better for my application or workload, you will have to first have some data with you. Before you can move anything on cloud, what data is needed? Data needed is like this. Number one, how much CPU and memory is actually allocated to your on-premise application and how much of it is actually used by your application? Do you know that very often on-premise applications are either over-provisioned or under-provisioned? What is over-provisioned? You might have given too much resources to it, like application is given four CPUs and 16 GB RAM, out of which application always use 50%. And only in a particular time frame, let's say morning or evening two hours, it uses 100% CPU and RAM, but otherwise it stays at half of the CPU and RAM. You know what you should do when you move to cloud then? You should use that as a base uh, pricing unit. Start with small size. And then if it is a periodic burst, then define an auto scaler based on time. You can do that on all the clouds, including Microsoft Azure. You can say that at evening five o'clock to seven o'clock, I want to scale my application to higher resources. But after eight o'clock, I want to scale down to the older pricing plan. Right now you can do all this type of decision making only if you have that monitoring data with you. Getting my point? Hello. So whenever, yeah. yeah, so basically it's like as a consultant, whenever I get this type of question, what is the correct VM size for my application or resource? I ask them how much resources your application consume when it is in normal mode with normal traffic, how much resources it consumes when it is idle. That means no user is connected to it. And how much resources it consume when it is at peak time. You give me that data and then I can suggest you which pricing plan to go for. I cannot just randomly just say, OK, go with free plan. It may not work with your application at all. You might end up doing over provisioning on cloud as well. Yes. And you know what is disadvantage of doing over provisioning on cloud? Higher cost. Yes. OK, so monitoring is not for detecting issues and uh, bugs, but it can also help you. Creating a performance benchmark. You should have this benchmark data available with you before you try any migrate operation. 
OK, then what is backup? Backup is a kind of business continuity solution. So what if my application goes down? I lost all my data. If you have the backup, you can restore it from it. Now, a very common question people ask about backup. People don't configure it in advance and then they say, OK, I lost my VM. Show me how to restore that. And then I ask them a question. Where did you take a backup or have you considered a backup? Please remember you have to first enable it. You have to take the backup periodically. Only then you will be able to restore it from the backup. So backup is another service which is example of business continuity service. Another one is disaster recovery. Anyways, these two services are required. For monitoring, please remember Azure provides a service called Azure Monitor. And under Azure Monitor, Azure can monitor lot many different things. Let me show you how many things you can monitor using Azure Monitor. Yes, there is an automation available for backup. You can automate backup, but remember you have to configure it in advance. By default, Azure is not going to configure backup for your service. You have to go and do that, at least for infrastructure services. Let me show you one example. This is Azure Monitor, and these are the services under Monitor right now. Let's say, for example, I don't have any under any application under monitoring. I'm not monitoring any virtual machine as well. You will notice one thing. There is no VM monitoring enabled. You will notice one thing. There are two VMs which are not currently under monitoring. OK, and it's because. Here both these VMs, I cannot enable monitoring because they are not running. One of them is available to monitor, but it's not running. Other one monitoring is not enabled. You can even monitor storage accounts or container instances or networks, virtual networks as well. OK, so as your monitor can monitor different types of things. There is one more. Uh, you will be surprised to know there is one more benefit of Azure Monitor. Azure Monitor can monitor resources outside Azure Data Center. Like you can extend Azure Monitor to monitor VMs, virtual machines, application, sorry, not applications. Yes, application as well. Applications and machines on on premise servers. You can monitor your on premise application and virtual machines also using Azure Monitor. OK. We call it hybrid monitoring. And by that logic, it is also possible to monitor resources or services running on other cloud platform like Google and AWS can also be monitored from Azure Monitor. You just have to install some agents. You have to do some configuration for that. OK. Yes, so monitoring and backup and recovery is other two important services on Azure. Fine. Now, so these all modules are part of AZ-104. And as I said earlier, you have to concentrate more on compute and networking. These are two bigger modules in AZ-104. All the other modules are given lower weightage or less weightage than all other modules combined. About AZ-104 examination, how we should prepare. If you all are if trying to, you let's say, prepare for AZ-104. Please remember, number one, you should use Microsoft official courseware that is available to use for the learning purpose. Please remember the Microsoft official courseware is an official courseware and it is automatically updated for you. You will access it from skillpipe.com website. OK, number two. You should practice or test all the labs. By the way, all the labs are already included in your MOC, but in case if you don't want them from MOC, there is a available version on GitHub. Let me show you that. In GitHub, go to Microsoft as you are learning and there are all the labs available here. Let me show you the link. Can you see all the labs here? Yes. Yes, there are total 
uh, more than 15 or 16 labs available here. And you should, after you do the learning, you should try these labs as well. Labs will actually help you to revalidate all the learnings that you have done via this MOC, Microsoft Official Courseware. Number three, after you do both these things, after you do both these things, right? You have to spend some time specifically, right? For, you know, kind of uh, going through another set of material available on Microsoft Azure portal, sorry, Microsoft Learning portal, Microsoft slash learning. And you will notice there is some material available on this portal as well. See, there are there are chances that whatever material is available here is already available in MOC as well. Rather, MOC will give you more contents compared to this one. Yes. But let me tell you why I'm keeping this on point number three. Remember, this is much less content than the MOC content. So use it like a summary or use it like a refresher. Getting my point? Hello? This is not your primary content. These are your refresher content. This will give you kind of a summary, basically, and you should be ready. Now, please remember, preparation time depends on whether, whether or not you have used cloud earlier. Those people who have already used cloud and know the cloud concept, you can give yourself one month to prepare for AZ-104. But if cloud is something new for you, then you have to first get yourself, uh, get yourself uh, you know, familiar with the cloud concept first and then prepare for the AZ-104. So preparation time you need to decide. It should be around roughly one month to three months max. Don't go beyond three months. You will actually get bored. Yeah. And those people who have already worked on Azure, right? And only not given AZ-104 exam, but quite some features already used. You can do that preparation even less than one month as well. Yes. There is also an article available here, right? For how to prepare for certification. And here they are given you two options, instructor led trainings or learning path. Microsoft Learn Portal URL, point number three. It's here. Wait a second. I guess Microsoft has recently added some support here for certification exam. This is the help page. If you have any kind of questions related to Microsoft certification exams, you should access this URL. This will give you all the commonly asked questions or frequently asked questions and their answers about exam, not the topics and exam. OK. Uh, something related to exam. Yeah. So do we, do we have any 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 particular question about certification now certification exam now? Yeah, anyone? It doesn't require AZ-900, correct? Yeah, AZ-900 is optional, not required. Please remember, AZ-104 could be your first certification exam, but there is only one benefit of AZ-900, by the way. Number one, AZ-900 is basic certification. And one huge benefit is you will get feel of Microsoft online exams. You will see the certification exam pattern and it is much better or much easier to clear compared to AZ-104, relatively much easier foundation level questions only. But you will get yourself familiarized with the certification exam, its UI and how you actually appear for the test. So basically, I would recommend now this is strange. Actually, my recommendation about AZ-900 is if you have never ever given any certification program exam, not just Microsoft, but for any. I would 
strongly recommend you to go for AC 900. But if you have given any certification exam, not just Microsoft, any other platform or vendor as well, there is no need for AZ-900. Just go with AZ-104 directly. Am I clear? Hello? Yes, got it. Yeah, now there is a strange incident that happened with me uh, a long back, 10 years back actually. Uh, I, was, I was actually appearing for a certification exam. Uh, what was that? No, it's not 10 years. It's 12, 13 years, I guess. It was a Sun Certified Java Programmer exam, SCJP. It's a Java program uh, certification exam. And the person who was sitting next to me, okay, each, each one of us was given a separate cubicle for the certification exam. It was where you, you know, you just go to certification center uh, and go, the, go and give the exam. The person, the other person, you know what he did? When the exam was launched, as usual, there was a screen where it gave some terms and conditions, right? Like what you should do and what you should not do while in an exam. And there were two buttons. I accept the terms and conditions and I do not accept the terms and condition. And guess what? He accidentally hit, I do not accept. And guess what? His exam was over. He didn't get even single question and got confused. What happened? Well, I'm not getting any question and he went outside to inquire what happened and the person attendant said your exam is done. So what what I'm saying here is you should make sure you should make sure or if you have an exam experience given any other exam go with AZ-104 directly or else go with AZ-900 much easier to crack much easier to prepare and you will get a complete feel of certification exam. OK, the UI and everything. OK. So I got it. Yeah, fine. So that's it for this event. Now we have 10 more minutes left. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask. And if you don't have any questions, please make sure that. Number one, you go and activate your MOC. Just use the link Chaitali has shared with you. Get the MOC code activated. You will activate it. There is instructions given already. Uh, number two, uh, you have you must have received a feedback link as well. Use that feedback link. OK. Yeah, uh, only two things. Yeah. See, AZ-104 is infrastructure service. Infrastructure services are considered as basic cloud services. Being a SAP uh, administrator or SAP consultant, right? It will just give you the bare minimum knowledge about Azure Cloud. I know that uh, the AZ-900 already gives you cloud basic, but it is considered too basic. Rather, AZ-900 talks generally about cloud as a platform. Right. And by the way, I guess as you do have specific certification for the other path and many such certification path. Fortunately or unfortunately recommend AZ-104 before uh, AZ-104 as a prerequisite. Can you see this? This is one for you as you are for SAP workload speciality and uh, Wait a second. OK, looks like AZ-104 is no longer mandatory for this. But can you see the recommendation? Now this is the trick. They are saying you don't actually have to up attend 104, but it is better if you use or it is better if you know as your administration. Can you see that, Prasad? I will share this link with you. This is for SAP.
it is very important to delete the resources I have deployed to save the Azure credits that I get here. Oh, you have already certified with 120 AZ120, Prasad? That's good then. Okay, I guess we don't have any more questions here. So Chaitali, hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm done. You can oh. continue from here. Sure, sir. Thank you. Okay, so guys, I have shared the MOC code with you all on your mail ID. So do redeem the code and get access to the MOC. Is that 104? Also, those who have yet to submit the MOC activation form, you can check the link in the chat box and fill out the form so I can share the code with you. Also, before leaving the session, do share your feedbacks on the session as your ses uh, session feedbacks are important to us. So, do this both the things before leaving the session. Thank you once again to all. Have a good day, everyone.